ஹாய் ஹலோ டு ஆல் குட் ஈவினிங் good evening good, good evening everyone uh rashekar reddy pranita so happy to see you all here uh, netravati ashwati navyashri yes good evening good evening to all kindly share the link to all your friends let them join for the class yes uh navya shri good evening hema krishna as yes, good evening to all yes good evening arti good evening vinita is yes, good evening divya mohan yes so today the session which i am going to take is very very important session so all the golden points will be covered in a nutshell so all the points in fon so i am going to cover in a nutshell okay like it will take 2 to 3 hours okay um, for 2 uh, to 3 videos it may take this is the first part okay this is a part 1 so i'll cover entire fon within just 2 uh, to 3 uh, classes okay this is this is a part 1 i want all of you to take your register and start writing notes along with me and if you have any doubts you can raise then and there okay or uh, please ask uh, your doubts uh, once the session gets completed so that i can easily address them okay yeah good evening uh, good evening uh, kavita good evening notification i think it will take time okay so kindly share the link so that without wasting time we can start our session yes vijay lakshmi good evening good evening shravanti good evening renuka pakala good evening thank you so much congrats pratyusha so i'm fine i'm fine so okay yes good evening good evening kalyani janaki ratod good evening good evening so okay uh so along with me you people also start uh, uh, pre- writing the notes okay and if you have any doubts you can ask me once the session gets completed i'll give you some time to address uh, okay to ask your doubts so that it will be easy f- for me to clear that okay at the end of the session okay so let starting with t- today's class okay starting with the medical hand washing okay fo and ultra rapid division similarly i have uh, so how i have taken for my class uh, like psychiatry similarly i have taken i'm going to take this fo in session also okay right starting with the ba- basic stuff in fon hand washing right so very very basic yet highly important procedure right okay so starting with the so starting with the medical hand washing see medical hand washing can be perf- can be f- performed by two methods okay uh, so what are that two methods is the first method which we have is abhr let me change the color of the pen just a minute okay the first one is abhr that is alcohol based hand rub okay this is alcohol based hand rub just a minute okay 
so uh, the first by which this medical hand washing uh, two methods can be fol followed to perform this medical hand washing the first one being alcohol based hand rub okay and the second one the best one will be soap and water okay soap and water and see as per cdc guidelines uh, center for disease control guidelines the alcohol based hand rub that you are going to use should at least have the concentration of 60% of alcohol in it very important okay 60% of alcohol should be there in alcohol based hand rub that you are going to use for your medical hand washing and total time for the alcohol based hand rub it should take somewhere around 20 to 30 seconds 20 to 30 seconds okay right so already told you there are two methods that is alcohol based hand rub and the soap and water soap and water the best will be the best will be soap and water or your hand wash okay right see here uh, before going into this let me ask you a basic question i want all of you to answer this basic question can you people tell me how many steps are there as per who how many hand washing steps are there only the rubbing hand rubbing steps how many steps are there your palm to palm interlacing all these steps how many steps are there yes excellent uh, Muthu Mohan it is six x s your you people are right there are six golden steps okay six golden steps uh, in hand washing as per your who right and only for that six steps at least you should spend 20 seconds of time as per CDC guidelines again you should spend at least 15 to 20 seconds for the rubbing of hands okay only to only for that six steps of six golden steps of hand washing uh, which is suggested by your who okay so only that should take at least 15 to 20 seconds for the rubbing of hands whereas for entire procedure uh, for uh, like taking the soap solution and till and following all the uh, all the steps of uh, hand washing and till you rinse your hand the entire procedure of medical hand washing it should be somewhere around 40 to 60 seconds that means one minute max okay you have to perform medical hand washing okay these timings can be asked in your norset exam kindly do remember this okay right so starting with the surgical hand washing okay medical hand washing got completed coming to surgical hand washing see uh, my dears please remember medical hand washing is still your wrist whereas surgical hand washing is till elbow okay from the fingertips till the elbow is your surgical hand washing and what is the timing for surgical hand washing for medical hand washing it is maximum of one minute for whereas surgical hand washing the, the maximum time is two to six minutes as per cdc guidelines it is two to six minutes okay right please remember these values these are very very important for your norset exam okay right so completed with the basic stuff of hand washing so now tell me in what sequence you are going to wear the pp dunning of pp that means how you are going to put on the pp so putting on the PPE in, in what sequence you are going to start your PPE? How you are going to with which PPE you are going to start? Yes, first I will start with the gown, right? Gown and then I will wear, after wearing gown, I will go with mask or the respirator, whatever it may be. And then after that, this sequence will be asked in your exam. Okay, in MCQ, they will give you the four different types of sequence and they'll ask you to pick up the right sequence in exam so kindly remember this sequence this is very important okay both the dunning and doffing is important okay so in uh, how um, so putting on the ppe first i'll start with gown then i'll start um, then i'll go with mask or respirator then i'll go with the face shield or googles and then finally i'll wear the gloves okay before performing the procedure the gloves will be sterile right so i'll wear it wear the gloves in the last okay that will be the last option this is the sequence of dunning pp putting on the pp whereas now taking off the pp now you have done the procedure and you want to 
take off the PPE. So what, how, in what manner you are going to take off? Yes, the first one is, first one that I am going to remove is since, yes, gloves is highly contaminated. Yes, I will remove my gloves first. Okay. And then I will remove my face shield or Google's whatever it may be. And then I will remove my gown. And then at the last, I am going to remove the mask. Okay. And at the last, I am going to remove the mask. Okay. Don't get confused. While you are putting on, the last is your gloves. And when you are taking off, doffing, when you are doffing PPE, mask will be the last option. Okay. Right. So, this is, how, what is, this is the sequence of putting on, taking off the PPE. Right. So, completed with the basic stuff. Now, we will start with the main important procedures. Okay starting with the ng tube insertion okay starting with the ng tube insertion uh, so the, what is the normal length of no, no, ng tube can you people tell me what is the normal length of ng tube it is i've already told you in many uh, like in many sessions i've already told you it is 100 centimeters okay it is 100 centimeters and the best ops uh, the best position here Okay, in which position you are going to insert the NG tube in conscious patients and in unconscious patients. In conscious patients, I am going to, just a minute, in conscious patients, which is, what is the position that you are going to provide during NG tube insertion? In conscious patients, yes, can you people tell me? Yes, excellent, uh, Pavitra, it is high Fowler's position. High Fowler's position in case of conscious patients, whereas in case of unconscious patients, it is. Can you people tell me in unconscious patients what is the position that I am going to provide? That is lateral decubitus position. Okay, lateral position. Why? Why lateral decubitus is pro provided in order to prevent aspiration? Okay. So yes. Yes. And now starting with the. Now coming to the sizes of NG tube. Sizes in children, we we'll, uh, usually we go with 10 French or less than that. And whereas in case of adults, in case of adults, in males, it is 14 French to 16 French commonly used. And whereas in case of females, okay, in case of females, it is 12 to 14 French okay that is these are the sizes that is commonly used okay in children and adults okay right so now uh, criteria followed during insertion this is very important just see the image here uh, okay just see the image here see so criteria in the sense okay so now you have to insert the ng tube Okay, uh, let us take the adult. Okay, now in an adult, you are going to, uh, you are supposed to insert an NG tube. Okay, how you are going to measure the NG tube before inserting it? You have to measure, right? So, how you are going to measure? From, see the measurement here. From the tip of the nose to the ear lobe and from the ear lobe to the zephy sternum, right? From the nose, tip of the nose to the ear lobe and from the ear lobe to the zephy sternum, right? Okay. So, what are the letters I have written here? N, E, X, the starting letters of the, okay, from the nose, ear lobe and the zephy sternum starting letters you can take that becomes the next criteria, okay, nose, ear, ear lobe and zephy sternum, okay. So, this is your next criteria that is followed in case of adults for the measurement of NG tube, whereas in case of children, can you people tell me whereas in case of children, which, how, how do we uh, measure NG tube in children? In children, it is not uh, zephy sternum. You will take from measurement from tip of the nose similar uh, to adults. From the tip of the nose to the ear lobe and from the ear lobe till the midway between the zephy sternum and the umbilicus. If you consider this as zephy sternum and this as umbilicus, somewhere around here, the midway between zephy sternum and the umbilicus you are going to take the measurement okay this will be the measurement in children okay from the nose to the ear lobe and from the ear lobe to the midpoint between umbilicus and the zephy sternum okay 
So nose, ear lobe and midway between umbilicus and the zephy sternum. This is the NEMO criteria that we are going to follow in case of children. Okay. Next criteria in adults, NEMO criteria in children. Very, very important criteria for the measurement of the NG tube. Okay. Right. So this can be asked in your exams. Okay. Right. So starting with no doubts, right? Okay. Yes, you are right Vinita, tip of the nose to the ear lobe then xiphoid process in adults whereas in case of children it is NEMU criteria, okay, right. So now here what they are asking is best confirmatory test for the right placement of the tube. Now you are a nursing officer and you have inserted a Riles tube uh, in a patient. See always remember one important point my dears, once you insert the NG tube immediately don't fix it, okay. You have to confirm the placement, okay, whether you have rightly inserted in the, into the stomach or not and then you are going to fix, okay, how you are going to confirm, the best confirmatory, yes, excellent Vinita, yes, you are right, you people are right, it is, right, you are right, it is x-ray, it is x-ray, x-ray is the best confirmatory test for the right, to, uh, to confirm the right placement of the NG tube, okay, right. And what are the other ways of confirming the right placement of NG tube? Can you people tell me the other methods? Okay, there are total five ways, five methods by which we can, can confirm NG tube placement. The best being the golden uh, test for confirmation of uh, the right placement of NG tube will be your X-ray, right? Yes, excellent Vinita, you are right. So the other one is, this is the first one. And the second one is aspiration of gastric content means you will check the pH. Yes, it is pH of the gastric contents and then as, as you people are saying it is whoosh test. What is whoosh test? You, inflate the, you will push the air through the engine and you will listen to the sounds via the stethoscope, right? That is whoosh test and the fourth one is um, air bubble test. Okay, placing in a water bowl and you will see for the air bubbles, right? And then Last, yes, as you said, it is inspection. When 50 to 55 centimeters of tube is inside, okay, till the 50, uh, 50 to 55, um, that marking is inside. Yes, that tells that the tube is in the stomach, right? So these are the five ways by which you can confirm for the right placement of the NG tube, okay? But the best or the golden way of, conf golden um, confirmatory test will be your X-ray, okay? Right. So, uh, NG tube, if you see any NG tube, there will be a line, okay, radio opaque line which we see that can be picked on X-rays, okay, right, uh, I've already told you this, next, always fix the NG tube with, so now you have inserted and you have confirmed by performing these five tests, now how you are going to fix the NG tube, NG tube, yes, can you people tell me, NG tube, how you are going to fix the NG tube? Don't use that leucoplast or whatever it may be. You okay? Now, now the guideline says to use tegardum. Okay, tegardum is a transparent uh, material that you'll get. Okay, with that you have to fix the NG tube. Okay, right. Okay, now what are these two images which is getting displayed here? Is there any difference or both both are same? Can you people tell me what is image A? What is image B? Both are same or any difference is there? Yes. It's not suction catheter my dear. See the tubes properly. See the images properly and then answer. Okay. Image A is your infant feeding tube. Infant feeding tube. And the image B is your NG tube. So how did I say this? Both are not same, both are different, right? So how did I say image A as infant feeding tube and how did I say image B as NG tube? See the see uh, the images properly, this is very very important. In my north side they have asked infant feeding tube, okay? Okay, you people at that time you, you will be in, uh, in an uh, anxiety mode and then you will pick up the wrong option and come. Okay, so listen to this carefully. Image A is infant feeding tube and image B is NG tube. How I am saying this? See here. See the image B. This is NG tube I said, right? 
see here it has a multiple markings it has a multiple markings on it okay it has markings on it right markings are present whereas here if you see the infant feeding tube nowhere you can find any marking here right so markings are absent in infant feeding tube this is the main differentiating point between the infant feeding tube and the ng tube okay right and if you in okay you can if you can just google it and see the tip of the here it is not clearly displayed so you can just google and see if the tip of the ng tube will have small small metallic uh, balls okay which are called as shots shots are present in case of ng tube and shots are absent in case of infant feeding tube okay so no markings no metallic balls in case of infant feeding tube whereas in ng tube you can find metallic balls and as well as markings are present on the ng tube this is how you will differentiate the infant feeding tube from the ng tube or your riles tube okay so this is very important okay these images can be asked okay kindly take at least screenshot those who are not preparing your notes these are very important okay right so uh, after removing the ng tube where in which bin you are going to discard the biomedical waste management can you people tell me in which bin you are going to discard you are going to discard that in red bin okay it's a basic question yes you are right, uh, you are correct navyashri yes netravati yes yes you are right it is red bin okay right now coming to the central venous catheter okay completed with ng uh, okay ng uh, ng tube uh, procedure and now coming with the central venous catheter again this is a very very important stuff for your exams okay okay at least one question you are going to get from this topic okay so all the today's today's class is like each and every topic is a golden uh, golden topic okay so i want all of you to prepare the notes and along with me okay right so start listening carefully right central venous catheter central venous catheter is uh, see where do you insert central venous catheter there are three main sites right three important sites of central venous catheter can you people tell me can you people tell me yes srinu is telling uh, right subclavian vein i okay ijv femoral yes yes you as you people rightly said yes okay the three most okay the three sites which are preferred for the central venous catheter insertion is the first being ijv internal jugular vein second is your subclavian vein and the last option will be femoral vein okay the last option will be your femoral vein okay these are the three sites of uh, where your central vein is uh, can be inserted okay right uh, see see the image here this is a three okay there are three lumens here right this is a triple lumen central venous catheter okay this is a triple lumen central venous catheter three lumens in the sense yes each and every lumen has it the name okay the proximal distal and the medial okay so how you will identify the which is proximal which is medial which is distal see the central line here see just pick up the long lumen here which is long here the white one this is long here right the longest one right in the central line so the longest will be proximal okay this is proximal the longest will be the proximal okay the longest will be the proximal and then see the central line which lumen is smallest this one this one is smallest right so this is distal the smallest will be distal always and the longest will be proximal lumen always in all the central lines okay and the leftover one this one is medial okay medial so don't mind my handwriting okay okay this is how you will pick up the lumens identify the lumens in the central line okay so i said you right there are three types of three lumens the proximal the distal and the medial right the prox in in proximal what are you, what what all you are going to administer in proximal port via the proximal port you are going to uh, take the samples 
you can perform sampling and you can administer the IV fluids via the longest this one the longest is the proximal uh, uh, lumen through which you will administer IV fluids and you will take the samples okay and distal very very important distal okay you will you just remember this as in OBGLs you uh, we use this BPD bipartal diameter it, but here it is not bipartal diameter I am giving you a mnemonic to remember the distal one so uh, B for blood transfusion P for uh, pressure monitoring central venous pressure monitoring in the D for distal okay so this is this is how I remember okay that's uh, okay so in distal lumen you can give the blood blood transfusion and mainly for central venous pressure monitoring I am giving a star mark on central venous pressure monitoring so this is how you will remember BPD okay BPD this is not bipartal diameter okay B for uh, BT that is blood transfusion P for pressure monitoring in the distal lumen okay right okay next coming to the medial one in medial one you will give TPN total parenteral nutrition if you want to give to the patient you will give via the medial lumen okay these are the uses of the triple lumen in the central venous catheter okay now can you people tell me what is the normal CVP pressure central venous pressure normal central venous pressure kya hai? <coughs> 18 to 12 <coughs> any other answers <coughs> any other answers See the normal uh, central venous pressure is 2 to just a minute. The normal central venous pressure in mm of Hg, if you want to say it is 2 to 6 mm of Hg, or you can also say in centimeters H2O that is 5 to 10 centimeters of H2O. Okay, right. This, this is the normal central venous pressure. Okay, right. So here what they are asking is the best site for CVC insertion. The best site for CVC insertion. What is the best site for CVC insertion? I have told you right three sites I have told you right. One is IJV, subclavian vein and the femoral vein which will be the best. Can you people tell me? Be fast. I have to cover a lot. Okay. Today, today the session will be little bit longer session. At least we will complete 30 to 40 percent of syllabus. The main syllabus in FON. Okay right uh, yes jugular subclavian vein yes krishna said it right Sub, the best site will be subclavian okay subclavian vein okay best if they're asking you it is subclavian okay but the most common why do uh, see the best i told you right the best site for cvc insertion is subclavian vein but the most common site of insertion is ijv internal jugular vein why sir the, you said that best site for cvc insertion is subclavian vein but now you are saying most commonly the site which we select in the hospitals is ijv why why is it so see subclavian vein there are okay there are life threatening complication with this subclavian vein it can cause a life threatening condition called pneumothorax okay uh, this subclavian approach can cause pneumothorax so that's why it is not uh, most commonly uh, done okay that is not most commonly done okay the most commonly uh, done in uh, uh, the most common site that is selected for cvc is internal jugular vein okay right next site for cvc insertion okay uh, again i'm telling you the best site for cvc insertion will be subclavian vein but usually subclavian vein is not a commonly uh, co it's not a common uh, site for selection for CVC insertion because there are increased risk of pneumothorax with subclavian vein approach. The most common site which is selected for CVC insertion is IJV that to right internal jugular. Right internal jugular. Okay. In options, right and left rendu ichinte right select chest kondi. Okay. Right internal jugular is the most common site of insertion of CVC. Now, site for CVC insertion. Site for CVC insertion in acute trauma. So now a patient came to you with a road traffic accident and now you want to insert a central vein catheter. Central venous catheter and which will be the best approach in that patient? Excellent Krishna, it is femoral vein. 
but femoral vein also not usually preferred why it is not usually preferred can anyone tell me why it is not usually preferred see there are dry areas and wet areas right this femoral vein is a wet area right the femoral is a wet area right it can easily get contaminated with urine fecal matter there are high chances of sepsis so that's why femoral vein is not usually preferred again okay there are increased risk of sepsis with this femoral approach so that's why it is also not preferred commonly okay right the and what is the most common central venous size used in adults Yes, what is the most common central venous catheter size that is used in adults? It is 7 French, okay? 7 French. What is the best site for providing TPN? Again, here they are saying it has best site, right? Best site. So whenever they say best site, it is subclavian vein, okay? Subclavian vein, SCV, okay? The best way to confirm the placement. Now you are... Uh, now the t now you are a nursing officer working in icu and uh, okay you and the okay icu physician had inserted the central venous catheter in a patient and now you have to confirm the placement how you will confirm the what is the best way to confirm the right placement of the central venous catheter whether it is in a right place or not how you will confirm whether it is rightly inserted or not whether it is in the right placement or not how you will confirm excellent excellent everyone of you are right it is x ray okay it is x-ray okay in x-ray what you what you are going to see on an x-ray can you people tell me what are, how you will confirm on an x-ray for the right placement of cvc see the tip of the cvc the central venous catheter should be at svc ra junction subclavian vein and right atrial junction okay it should be in the tip of the central venous catheter should be at the svc ra junction okay so that's how you will confirm the right placement of the uh, CVC. Okay, next. Uh, the most dangerous complication I have already told you. Now you people are going to answer. What is the most dangerous complication associated with uh, central venous catheter? Yes. What is the most dangerous complication associated with central venous catheter? It is pneumothorax. Excellent Krishna. It is PTX. Pneumothorax. But the most dangerous complication if they are asking you then you have you will select pneumothorax most common complication if they are asking you then the answer becomes the most common complication if they are asking you then can you people tell me what is this most common complication is infection okay klebsi central line associated bloodstream infections okay most common complication will be klebsi but most dangerous complication associated with cvc is pneumothorax okay now this this is for only for nursing staff okay for nursing officers for you for future nursing officers okay now you people are going to uh, tell me this so before using central venous port as a nursing officer Okay, now you are going to, now you want to give some IV fluid or you want to give some drugs via the central line. Okay, before you touching, before you giving the drug or administering whatever it may be via the central line, what procedure you are going to perform? Yes, have decontamination, cleaning the pores, right. You people are right. So, obviously hand hygiene to be performed and not only hand hygiene, you also should wear the gloves, sterile gloves before touching central line. Do not, so... Since you have performed hand washing, you cannot touch directly the central lines. Even though you, after performing central, uh, like hand hygiene, you have to wear the sterile gloves and only gloved hand should be, should be coming in contact with the central lines, okay? Do not touch the central lines. Never ever touch the central lines with bare hands, okay? It should be always, yes, you need to wear the sterile gloves always before touching the central lines, okay? Right. And now, yes, as you people said, you have to disinfect like you have to scrub the hub okay, that is called as scrub the hub okay before you using the uh, like central venous port you will remove the cap and you will take the 70 percent alcohol swab and then you will clean the hub of the central line and then you will uh, insert the you, then you will administer the medication okay every time you have to perform every time whenever you want to use a central line port you have to perform this procedure which is called as scrub the hub okay scrub the hub okay 
This is very, very important. Scrubbing the hub is very, very important with 70% alcohol swab. Okay, 70% alcohol swab need to be used for the scrubbing the hub of the center line. Okay, right. So next, dressing. How you are going to perform center line dressing? This is also very important uh, in, okay, coming to the uh, uh, N1 responsibility. At the site, okay, now you have, at the site, of the insertion of the central venous catheter can you people tell me why which solution you will be using to clean the central venous catheter at the site of insertion yes at the site of insertion with which solution you are going to clean yes be fast let me see who will answer this betadine circular movement exception cleaning betadine Okay, any other answers? Betadine? No, it is not betadine, it is 2% chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine. With this solution, you are going to... Okay, site cleaning need to be done at the site of insertion. You will clean with 2% chlorhexidine. Yes, Divya Mohan, you are right. <coughs> and then, then scrubbing the hub, I have already told you, right? It is 70% alcohol swab. You are going to use for the scrubbing the hub. See, don't confuse at the site of insertion of the central uh, central vein, you will clean the area with 2% uh, chlorhexidine, whereas the scrub the hub is done with 70% alcohol swab. Okay, and now coming to the when you will change how often you have to perform central line dressing. In if it is gauze dressing, if it is gauze dressing, okay, then every second day you will change the gauze dressings, okay, or whenever it is soiled. It is not that a second day only I should do. It is not like that. Okay. When, okay, you have done, you have done uh, like dressing. Okay. Within few hours, if it is getting soiled, yes, that's an indication for central line dressing. Okay. Right. So, every second day, you have to change the god dressing or whenever it becomes soiled, you have to change the dressing. Okay. If it is tegardum dressing, yes, in case of tegardum, five to seven days once you will change the tegardum dressing or whenever it is soiled here also okay five to seven days once you will change the tegardum dressing center line tegardum dressing okay right now for example uh, see here uh, if you want to uh, if you want to continue the center line okay now the patient is on center line and if you want to continue the center line for a long period okay the patient is receiving tpn total parental nutrition and the okay for a long period he is going to receive tpn Okay, he needs center line for a longer period. Then, okay, this is the, there is a special center line which is available. This is called as, see the image here, this is called as tunneled cath. Okay, which is also called as Hickman line. Hickman line. So, this is a special center, center line catheter that can be used for longer duration. Okay, the patient who, who, who will be receiving TPN for a longer time or who needs center line for a longer time this is the best option for them okay what is the advantage with this hickman line there is decreased risk of clepsy or sepsis okay that is the advantage with this hickman line okay right. completed with the central line any doubts in central line any doubts in central line Uh, Naveen Kumar, uh, see, uh, no, it is not into the right atrium. It is at the tip. The tip of the central line catheter should be at the SVC RA junction. It, SVC and RA ka junction. Okay, right. Right. So now coming to the. Okay, if you have no doubts, then I'll proceed with the next topic. Okay, starting with the urinary catheter. Again, this is very important. Okay, it will not leave you. Okay, each and every topic which I'm discussing today or golden topics is yes, kindly listen to this and prepare your own notes. Okay, right. S starting with the urinary catheter. Uh, see here, see the image here, this image. Right, so you are seeing something yellow. Uh, the, what is this? This is three-way follies, right? So since there are three lumens this becomes three way follis okay this is yellow right what is this this is made up of rubber latex okay and here it is white this is also three way follis but here it is white okay this is silicon 
silicon follies catheter okay and what is this see the image this one what is this usually we use this in males only okay this is called condom catheter okay this is called condom catheter and what is this this image okay there is no balloon at all this is a, okay it's a single straight catheter right which is, which we call it as k90 catheter okay this is k90 catheter which is a straight catheter okay for single time use this k90 catheter is for single time use if you want to drain the urine you have to empty the bladder before any surgeries or any other procedures yes you can use this straight catheter okay yes see here what is this what is this one this is also some this also has no nothing uh, no balloon and uh, something you can see uh, it is made up of rubber and it is red okay red in color right so this is red rubber catheter this is red rubber catheter which is also straight catheter okay the previous image this one <coughs> the k90 is also straight catheter and red, uh, red rubber tube is also straight catheter what is the difference main difference k90 is made up of pvc okay polyvinyl chloride and here it is already mentioned it is made up of rubber that's only the difference both are straight catheters okay and come to this image now okay what is this see the tip of the catheter how it how the tip up, is appearing to you all is okay it's resembling the tip like flower shape right it is in the shape of a flower okay the tip is like a flower okay what is this type what is this catheter called can anyone tell me what is this catheter called let me see who will answer excellent uh, pranita excellent right pranita answered it quickly yes it is malicot nephrostomy catheter <coughs> malicot catheter right this is also has same fun uh, has this malicot also has the same function as your follies okay and since it has a flower like tip it, it is self-retaining catheter once you insert it it can read okay it can self-retain itself okay uh, as your fall is okay fall is you will inflate the balloon right so that it becomes uh, self-retaining right similarly here the flower tip it has flower tip right this is also self-retaining like your fall is catheter self-retaining okay right now uh, I already told you right uh, three in, I have already shown you the image of three-way fall is let us see what are the fun functions of these three uh, three lumens here okay this one the top one this one uh, okay this is for uh, balloon inflation balloon inflation and the middle one is for draining of the urine you will connect this to the urine euro bag to drain the urine and the, the leftover this one right this one is for cbi what is cbi continuous bladder irrigation okay for this is this the uh, this port is for cent, uh, continuous bladder irrigation usually uh, three way fall is we use uh, post turp surgeries okay post turp surgeries what is turp trans uh, transurethral resection of prostate post turp surgeries in those patients for uh, bladder irrigation continuous bladder irrigation you will put three-way fall, fall is okay okay these are the functions of this uh, three lumens in fall is coming to the sizes of fall is okay i already told you this in my previous classes when i'm taking for north i think north set uh, 5.2 i take uh, <coughs> i have discussed this <coughs> okay just a minute sizes of fall is okay so how you will remember okay with this uh, mnemonic you can remember the sizes color codings of the fall is okay this is very important again in your NOSET exam they'll ask you they'll show you uh, a urinary catheter and they'll ask you uh, what is the size of this urinary catheter okay by seeing the color of the urinary uh, catheter you, ha you have to identify the size okay so I'll tell you how you I'll, how you will be uh, how you need to identify the size with the colors okay so for that remember this mnemonic okay remember remember this mnemonic go recheck your personal bank account okay whatever it may be go recheck your personal bank take the first letters of this and that becomes your colors okay so g for green 
O for orange, R for red, A, Y for yellow, P for purple, B for blue. Okay. Now these are the color codings. Okay. Next coming to the <coughs> sizes. Okay. Fall is it will be written in French. Okay. So start from here. Okay. It is 14, 16, 18, 20, 22 and 24 French. Okay. This is the sizes. So this is how you will remember. Go recheck your personal bank is the mnemonic. G for green, O for orange, R for red, Y for yellow, P for purple, P for blue. Okay. These are the color coding. Start from 14. It will and then, okay. Green is 14, orange is 16, red is 18, yellow is 20, and purple is 22, blue is 24 French. Okay. Right. So these are these color codings and sizes are same for your NG tube also. Okay. It's same for RT <coughs> Rails tube also. Okay. Next. Coming to the fall is balloon. Okay. See here what they are asking you is for now you have inserted the catheter. Okay. The fall is catheter and uh, fall is balloon. How you are going to inflate. Okay. What solution you are going to use to inflate the fall is balloon. Can you people tell me what are all the solutions? What is the solution that is recommended? Yes. You people are right. Vinta is telling 10 ml of distilled water. Ranjit is telling distilled water. Okay, so everyone is saying uh, distilled water. See, uh, can I inflate fall is balloon with air? Even with air, we can inflate balloon, right? Can I inflate fall is balloon with air? No. See, before going to this, uh, okay, before going to this topic, just remember. One important point I want all of you to remember, do not inflate Foley's balloon with air or I have seen many times people inflating Foley's balloon with normal saline. Even normal saline is not recommended or NS. Do not inflate. Okay, why? Why shouldn't be using air or NS? See here. Uh, you can inflate Foley's balloon with air, normal saline or distilled water. But the one which is recommended is the recommended solution is distilled water as you people said. Okay. Again, the guideline says not to use air and NS. Why? Because normal saline is a crystalloid, right? It has tendency to get crystallized. Okay. It can get crystallized in the Foley's balloon. Okay. So then the catheter can get stuck and you there will be difficulty in removal, right? Whenever you use normal saline or whenever you use air, once the bladder gets filled with urine, since you have inflated the balloon with air, so that will freely float in the urine. Okay. In the bladder, the air, the one which you have filled, the, the balloon which you have filled with air, it will freely float in the full bladder. That once your bladder gets filled with urine, okay, so that the urine can get leaked, okay, so that there will be urinary leakage problem with air and this NS can get crystallized. So that's why guideline says not to use air or normal saline to inflate the Foley's balloon and the one which is recommended is distilled water, okay, right. And what is the quantity? Yes, you people rightly said it is 10 ml that I'm going to use to inflate the Foley's balloon. Okay, right. Now, most commonly used uh, uh, size. What is the most commonly used Foley's size in males? In males, the most commonly used is 16 French. 16 French is orange. Right? 16 is orange, right? Yes. And then 14 French in females. 14 is green in color. Okay? Right. So most commonly used uh, catheter size in case of males, it is 16 French. The 16 French is will be in orange color. 
and whereas females it is 14 French green color okay right <coughs> any doubts <coughs> yes 14 French for women that's <coughs> sorry <coughs> 16 French for orange Next, <clears throat> okay, so see here, okay, now how you will discard this, uh, what is this, okay, this is the duration of Follis catheter, okay, I have not given it, uh, heading has been missed here, it is, this one is for duration, how much duration, so duration of uh, what is the total duration I can keep a uh, patient on uh, rubber follies, single follies, single rubber follies. See rubber uh, follies catheter if you have ins that is latex uh, follies if you have inserted in any client it should be changed within like after seven days. Okay, so seven days for your latex follies that is your rubber follies and which is made up of silicon. The maximum days that can be that uh, silicon fall is, uh, uh, is okay can be left in a patient is <coughs> 30 days okay <coughs> <coughs> so when should i change euro back yes when should I change? Uh, how often I should change Euro back? Yes, I think in most of the books they have given different values in uh, different books. When I'm going through the different books, yes, they are giving different values. But yes, this this you can take for your exam. Okay, for your Northside exam, rubber uh, rubber follies it should be changed after seven days, and silicon follies it should be changed after thirty days, and Euro bag also weekly you have to change that is seven days once in a week you have to change euro bag okay now now tell me where you are going to discard the urinary catheter now you have removed a follies from a patient and where you are going to discard it okay <coughs> proper disposal is very very important okay yes excellent everyone of you said rubber r for rubber r for red it will go into the red bin okay <coughs> And where you will discard the euro euro bag <coughs> so if your euro bag is filled with urine urine yes you people rightly said ganga yes yes you people yes vinita red even euro bag will be discarded in red bin but euro bag if it is filled with urine that urine you will you you had you have to get it discarded in uh sluice room okay in deep drain system you have to dis uh, you have to get it discarded the urine and then the euro bag will be discarded in the uh, red bin okay euro bag euro bag will be discarded in the red bin okay so no doubt <coughs> no doubt in this <coughs> so now uh, okay so completed there's a uh, okay uh, here uh, they're giving they're asking you if there is a fall is balloon blockage right so you have to remove a fall is from okay for a patient and you can okay the, you cannot de you couldn't able to deflate it you're not able to def you're not able to deflate and the fall is got blocked you cannot able to remove the tube so at this case what you're going to do yes sujata good evening in this case what will be done? What should be done? Can you people tell me? Yes, fall is balloon blockage, needle prick. Okay, Divya Mohan is telling needle prick. Yes, can you people tell me? F see, fall. If there is, if you notice any fall is balloon getting blocked or it, okay, difficulty in removal of fall is okay, then don't pull it forcefully. It can damage. Okay, right. So, if there is follies balloon blockage or follies balloon stuck in the bladder, so what should be done is you will inflate the balloon with water. 
okay then after inflating the balloon further you will inflate the you are hearing me right okay you will inflate the uh, foliage balloon with water furthermore and then what you will uh, okay then the balloon will be punctured okay then the balloon will be punctured with the help of ultrasound okay with ultrasound guidance the balloon will be punctured okay so then the tube will be okay this is uh, th this can be done <coughs> or a few uh, a few books they are saying that uh, you can also use mineral oil okay you will just uh, inflate the balloon with the mineral oil so that the mineral uh, mineral oil has the capacity to dissolve the balloon okay it will dissolve the balloon and you can remove the foliage okay you can use the mineral oil also but which is the best this is the best one okay right and one more important point i want all of you to remember when you are doing urinary catheterization or foliage catheterization in any male patient especially do not inflate the balloon until the catheter is inserted till the y junction see uh, if you want to catheterize any male okay then you have to see after taking the foliage and starting insert start inserting the foliage you have to insert the fall uh, okay you have to insert the foliage till the y junction is received okay you, you'll, the foliage will be like this right just a minute <clears throat> like this right till the y junction you will insert till the y junction you will insert okay you have to insert and uh, okay once the y junction is reached then you will inflate okay then you then you then only have to inflate the balloon okay and then you will pull slow, slowly pull uh, pull back the remaining tube out okay understood do not inflate the balloon until unless the catheter this is very very important step i want all of you to remember when you are per, this may be a, this may be uh, this might be a simple point but whenever you are performing urinary catheterization tomorrow here in clinicals okay you will you will be you, you, there will be a tendency to inflate okay so once you insert half of the tube you, you people will inflate so that will damage the urethra in the males okay so it is not like that okay you have to insert the urinary catheter okay totally inside till the y junction is reached and then after re once you reach the y junction then only you are going to inflate the foliage balloon with 10 ml of distilled water again don't use air don't use normal saline only use distilled water to inflate the foliage balloon okay right <coughs> okay so now <coughs> completed with urinary catheterization coming to a very very important topic i want all of you to uh, uh, take notes on this okay coming to the blood transfusion okay so before going to the blood transfusion let us uh, see uh, blood components what are all the blood products that are available can you people tell me what are all the blood products that are available usually what we see in the wards can you people tell me it's okay it's not any rocket science you people can tell yes what are the components yes be fast starting with whole blood okay miss estrogen yes welcome to yes welcome to the session uh navya street wbc don't answer wbc whenever anybody asks you what are the different types of blood products that are available for uh, transfusion never answer them wbc okay we don't we don't have that facility at all okay we don't get wbc from blood banks okay there is no, nothing like that okay okay so let me uh, yes good evening good evening yeah so let me let me tell you okay so just listen to this carefully and please draw the table similar which uh, similar to this which i have drawn okay nen ela draw chesano alage draw cheskoni okay this each this in this table each and every line is a golden point okay so nen ela gaithe draw chesano alage draw chesi notes aithe raskondi this is very very important <coughs> okay starting with the whole blood okay just a minute starting with the whole blood okay starting with the whole blood 
వన్ యూనిట్ ఆఫ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ వన్ యూనిట్ అంటే ఒక ప్యాకెట్లో ఎంత వాల్యూమ్ ఉంటుంది సో వన్ ప్యాకెట్ ఆఫ్ బ్లడ్ కంటైన్స్ హౌ మచ్ వాల్యూమ్ ఇన్ ఇట్ ఓకే వన్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ యూనిట్ కంటైన్స్ త్రీ ఫిఫ్టీ ఎంఎల్ ఆఫ్ త్రీ ఫిఫ్టీ ఎంఎల్ వాల్యూమ్ ఇన్ ఇట్ వన్ యూనిట్ వన్ ప్యాకెట్ వన్ ప్యాకెట్ యూజువలీ వీ డోంట్ సై ఇట్ ఇస్ వన్ ప్యాకెట్ వీ కాల్ ఇట్ ఇస్ వన్ యూనిట్ ఓకే వన్ యూనిట్ ఆఫ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ కంటైన్స్ త్రీ ఫిఫ్టీ ఎంఎల్ ఆఫ్ బ్లడ్ అండ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద కంటెంట్స్ ప్రజెంట్ ఇన్ ఇట్ ఎస్ ఇన్ దిస్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ దిస్ వన్ యూనిట్ ఆఫ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ కంటైన్స్ వాట్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద కంటెంట్స్ ప్రజెంట్ ఇన్ ఇట్ ఇట్ హ్యాస్ ప్లాస్మా ఆబ్వియస్లీ సిన్స్ ఇట్స్ ఏ హోల్ బ్లడ్ ఎస్ ప్లాస్మా ఇట్ హ్యాస్ ఆర్బీసీస్ రెడ్ బ్లడ్ సెల్స్ అండ్ ఇట్ విల్ ఆల్సో కంటైన్ ప్లేట్లెట్స్ రైట్ దీస్ ఆర్ ఆల్ ద కంటెంట్స్ ఆఫ్ ద హోల్ బ్లడ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఇండికేషన్స్ ఆఫ్ గివింగ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఇండికేషన్స్ ఆఫ్ గివింగ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ కెన్ యూ పీపుల్ టెల్ మీ వాట్ ఆర్ ద ఇండికేషన్స్ ఆఫ్ గివింగ్ హోల్ బ్లడ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ హెమరేజ్ ఓకే ఇట్స్ హెమరేజ్ so if if a patient is uh, uh, a patient had met with accident okay road traffic accident whatever it may be and the patient is bleeding profusely then in that patient everything is lost right the, there is okay if there is bleeding plasma is lost platelets will be lost and rbc is lost so we need to replace everything so that's why whole blood is a best option in that hemorrhage cases next coming to <coughs> as you people said prbc packed red blood cells okay packed red blood cells one unit of flat, packed red blood cells contains again 350 ml of rbcs uh, okay and then what are the contents the name itself is saying right packed red blood cells okay it has red okay it will it has rbcs in it okay the name itself is telling packed rbc so rbc is the main content what is the indication of giving uh, prbc can you people tell me what is the indication of giving packed red blood cells okay in obg i would be saying very frequently right anemia in pregnancy severe anemia right not only in uh, pregnant uh, obs normally in general medicine yes severe anemia is an indication for administering prbc okay if a patient has severe anemia okay that's an indication for uh, that's an indication for giving pr packed red blood cells and can you people tell me uh, if you have seen in hospitals the patient comes uh, comes to hospitals every month for blood transfusion what which cases comes to blood transfusion monthly can you people tell me which patient comes to hospitals for getting blood transfused every month excellent excellent thalassemia major Tran- your dialysis is a different uh, modality yes uh, yeah there are many co- uh, indications for prbc i'm just giving you one one or two main indications okay thalassemia cases prbcs are very every month you have to give thal- like uh, prbcs right so thalassemia major beta thalassemia <coughs> okay major these cases they'll be on that's a transfusion dependent thal- anemia right okay they cannot survive without getting prbcs okay so what at what temperature you are going to store prbcs can you people tell me at what temperature you are going to store prbc yes be fast let me see you are going to answer what is the storage temperature of prbc Mm, yes 2 to 8 okay let me tell you let me complete it fast otherwise it will it is going to consume time okay prbc one unit contains 350 ml content is rbcs and what are the indication the main indication will be severe anemia okay and thalassemia and storage storage temperature will be 1 to 6 degree celsius okay 1 to 6 degree celsius but if you want to uh, answer single single option if you single answer if you want to give in your exam okay this is the range 1 to 6 degree celsius is a range but whereas if you want to give a single answer it is uh 4 degrees 4 degrees celsius will be single best option for your exams okay 
if you want to answer it in a range then it is 1 to 6 degrees celsius okay yes uh, indra have answered it as right it is 1 to 6 degrees celsius in a range but if you want to select a single option then it is 4 degrees again i am telling you it is not minus degrees it is not minus degrees okay right so what is the shelf life period of prbcs can you people tell me right it is 35 days what is the shelf life period let me see how many members are going to answer this it is 35 days okay 35 days will be the packed red blood cell shelf life <coughs> okay max okay if you yes 35 days but maximum it is 42 days okay in exam the, if there is no option called 35 okay select 42 days okay 42 days okay so i'm not asking the lifespan of rbc's my dear niharika i'm asking the shelf life period of prbc okay <clears throat> so single best answer to select in norset exam is 35 days okay if 35 days is not given any option then select 42 days right but the single best option will be 35 days okay now coming to so now prbc is got completed and now we have something called ffp fresh frozen plasma so one unit of fresh frozen plasma contains 200 ml of volume okay 200 ml and what are the contents it is fresh frozen plasma plasma it is highly packed with uh, clotting factors your coagulation factors okay fresh frozen plasma is highly concentrated with clotting factors okay what are the indications of giving clotting factors see fresh frozen plasma 200 ml is a one unit volume one unit of ffp contains 200 ml and contents will be clotting factors okay plasma it is concentrated with clotting factors and indications of giving ffp what does ffp contains clotting factors so in which condition should i give uh, ffp yes clotting factors right in anticoagulant toxicity like warfarin toxicity where the patient will be bleeding due to anticoagulant toxicity like warfarin toxicity right you can give uh, just a minute you can give warfarin toxicity patient is going to bleed so that's why you're going to give clotting factors and then uh, and you can also give that in dic shock this uh, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy the patient again is going to bleed okay due to lack of this uh, clotting factors you will give clotting factors in this case and in case of burns why in case of burns this plasma is lost via the burn skin okay so that's why plasma to be replaced in burns patient by giving ffp okay these are the indications of giving ffp okay what is the storage temperature of uh, ffp can you people tell me what is the storage temperature of ffp fresh frozen plasma it is minus 18 degrees celsius to minus 30 degrees celsius okay right so what is the shelf life period of ffp it is two years okay right next uh, what are what what is the other blood product which we have is cryo precipitate right cryo precipitate one unit contains 15 ml 15 ml what are the contents cryo precipitate it is it usually contains clotting factor one that is your fibrinogen and clotting factor eight okay these two clotting factors are rich in cryo precipitate so where do you give cryo precipitate in peds well when you are studying hematology yes i think you, you would have studied right in case of hemophilia a in case of hemophilia a where there is factor 8 deficiency you will give this cryo precipitate since it has factor 8 in it and you also can give this in von willebrand disease okay von willebrand disease right and what is the storage temperature of cryoprecipitate again it is stored in minus degrees minus 30 degrees celsius okay and the lifespan is one year for cryoprecipitate and and the leftover is platelets prp platelet rich plasma 
ओके वन यूनिट कंटेन्स फिफ्टी एम एल ओके वन यूनिट कंटेन्स फिफ्टी एम एल कंटेन्स इट इज ऑलरेडी इन द नेम प्लेटलेट रिच प्लास्मा इट हेज प्लेटलेट्स वेट डू एव प्लेटलेट्स वेट डू एव प्लेटलेट्स इन ऑल द केसेस ऑफ थ्रॉम्बोसाइटोपीनिया मेनली इन डेंग्यू फीवर डी एच एफ राइट एंड इन ऑंको केसेस ल्यूकीमियास राइट वेट वॉट एवर इट मे बी थ्रॉम्बोसाइटोपीनिया इन ऑल थ्रॉम्बोसाइटोपीनिया दैट्स एन इंडिकेशन फॉर गिविंग प्लेटलेट्स ओके लो प्लेटलेट काउंट थ्रॉम्बोसाइटोपीनिया इज एन इंडिकेशन फॉर PRP. Okay, what is the storage temperature of PRP? PRP is stored in between 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. Very, very important. Okay, I'm highlighting this. It can be asked in your exams. 22 to 24 degrees Celsius is the storage temperature for platelet-rich plasma, and then shelf life period will be somewhere around. What is this? Uh, now I'll ask you. What is the uh, shelf life period of platelets? Platelets. What is the shelf life period of platelets? Is be is answer it fast. Yes. No, no. I am not asking storage temperature. Excellent, Divya Mohan. It is five days. Okay. Right. Okay. This this table should be copied as it is, and it should be saved in your mind as it is. Okay. This is very 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 important. Okay. Right. It is not seven days, my dear. It is five days. Okay. right again okay so here i want all of you to remember these two special points okay so one unit see this uh, uh, here i have made a circle and made a dot right this is this is one unit one unit usually we write it as like this in clinical area okay so one unit of prbc if you are giving to a client okay so, uh, it will raise the hb by it will raise the hemoglobin by 1 g per deciliter and it will raise the hematocrit value hematocrit value by 3% okay let's suppose i'll give you a case uh, for example there is a, a, a pregnant lady or uh, whatever it may be okay let, let us take a patient who, whose uh, hemoglobin is 6 g okay so now you have uh, given blood okay one uh, one unit of packed red blood cells you have uh, okay transfused to the patient and after transfusing okay so how much hemoglobin that one packet of prbc rises in that client is okay i said it is 6 right okay one unit will rise 1 g okay so from 6 it becomes 7 okay so post transfusion if you check the ch check her h hp level it would be 7 okay so that means one unit one unit one packet of rbc will raise the hp by 1 g per deciliter and it will raise the hematocrit by 3% this is very important for your exam and similarly ffp it will raise the clotting factors since i already told you ffp fresh frozen plasma is concentrated packed with clotting factors it will raise the clotting factors by 2% okay one unit will rise by 2% okay right okay so now what is the most common complication seen with blood transfusion now you have to uh, tell me this what is the most common complication seen with blood transfusion let me see who will say this what is the most common complication seen with blood transfusion yes hiv no okay yes excellent divya mohan s yes, it's fnhtr what is fnhtr febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction very important mcq for exams fnhtr fnhtr febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction is the most common complication seen with bt blood transfusion okay so see why uh, okay why does it happen okay the patient when you give the blood the patient can develop fe uh, fever chills okay why this happens febrile non hemolytic transfusion reaction why it is uh, most common complication see here um, if if the donor's blood donor's blood low wbc sunindi ante a wbc se epudaithe manam recipient ki istamo 
ఆ డబ్ల్యూబీసీ ఉన్న బ్లడ్ని ఆ డబ్ల్యూబీ డోనా డబ్ల్యూబీసీకి అగైనెస్ట్గా యాంటీబాడీస్ ప్రొడ్యూస్ అవుతాయి రెసిపియంట్లో ఎవరికైతే మనం ఇస్తానమో వాళ్ళల్లో సో దాట్ ఈస్ రెస్పాన్సిబుల్ ఫర్ దిస్ రియాక్షన్ ఎఫ్ఎన్ఎస్టిఆర్ ఓకే సో అగైన్ ఐఎమ్ టెలింగ్ యూ ఇన్ ఇంగ్లీష్ సో దిస్ ఎఫ్ ఫెబ్రైల్ అండ్ నాన్ హిమోలైటిక్ ట్రాన్స్ఫ్యూషన్ రియాక్షన్ ఈజ్ డ్యూ టు ప్రొడక్షన్ ఆఫ్ యాంటీబాడీస్ టువర్డ్స్ ద డబ్ల్యూబీసీ డోనార్స్ డబ్ల్యూబీసీ ఓకే right so how it can be prevented i am telling you wbc donor wbc donor wbc is a main uh, reason for this fnstr right so how it can be prevented by leuco reduction okay by leuco reduction by giving leuco reduced products what is leuco reduction leuco means white blood cells reduced means you are going to remove it from the blood okay uh, okay so by administering leuco reduced products for example when you are donating your blood you you would have seen that leuco filters okay leuco filters right so that will separate the all the wbc okay so that this complication the chances of this complication is decreased okay so admin it has leuco filters okay use of leuco filters is uh, that's m- mandatory nowadays and uh, leuco reduced products by giving leuco reduced products you can prevent this fnstr okay right so do you have any doubts with this do you have any doubts with this okay <coughs> so now what is the rap okay now uh, you want to give blood to the patient and now your shift is getting completed and as a nurse you are a nursing officer your shift shift kit is uh, your shift is getting completed and you have administered the blood very rapidly in the uh, patient very fastly you have given the blood so the rapid administration of blood can lead to a serious complication called taco what is taco transfusion associated circulatory overload please don't mind my handwriting okay a transfusion associated circulatory overload taco if you administer blood very fastly this rapid administration of blood can lead to a serious condition called taco transfusion associated circulatory overload the, okay it can cause circulatory overload the patient can go into cardiac failure acute cardiac failure the patient can develop pulmonary edema dyspnea many things can happen okay serious complications can occur due to rapid administration of blood okay so what is this taco remember this very important okay and next what is the leading cause of death after bt it is not taco okay it is trally something called trally what is trally transfusion uh, related acute lung injury so okay transfusion related acute lung injury okay uh, here in this trally again the patient will have uh, non cardiogenic pulmonary edema the patient can develop acute pulmonary edema and hypoxia dyspnea everything so this is acute lung injury the name itself is telling you right the transfusion related acute lung injury it's a leading cause of death after blood transfusion okay so what is the most common blood products uh, that causes trally most common blood products that causes trally okay transfusion related uh, acute lung injury is your plasma and platelets very important it is not prbc it is plasma and platelets that causes this trally okay and okay so now uh, you have received a blood packet in your hand and you want to administer to the to a client okay what will be the maximum transfusion time with okay the maximum transfusion time to give that whole unit of blood to that patient will be 4 hours if it is prbc within 4 hours you have to transfuse it okay once if you receive prbc from the blood bank it should be transfused within 4 hours okay otherwise if it is exceeding it it can lead to sepsis okay right platelets platelets should be administered within 30 minutes even similarly for ffp also it should be trans uh, it should be transfused within 30 minutes okay right <coughs> so if you notice any transfusion reaction so as a nursing officer th- this question had been asked multiple times in your norset exam so as a nursing officer your uh, transfuse you have started blood transfusion and immediately have seen 
the patient developing rashes okay uh, okay rashes over the body and itching so what what immediately have to do is the immediately which is nothing but anaphylaxis the patient can have anaphylaxis right uh, then what you will do is immediately you will stop the transfusion immediately you will stop the transfusion and then you will second step then you will inform the doctor okay and then you will maintain the patency of iv line the same iv line the patency should be maintained by administ starting the ns you have to start ns to maintain the patency of iv line okay right so next what is the transfused rbc ka lifespan okay normal rbc's lifespan is 120 days half of half of that is your transfused rbc lifespan 60 days 50 to 60 days is transfused rbc lifespan okay next you have to always discard the blood bag in dash bin okay biomedical waste management is very important if you generate the waste you have to discard right right so how in which bag you will discard see don't confuse blood bag you will generally confuse between this blood bag and urine bag blood bag and urine bag okay blood will be in red color right so it will go into yellow bin opposite color okay remember like this okay blood will be red in color it should it should go into an opposite color that is yellow color bin okay this is bin yellow color bin blood bag should be discarded in yellow bin whereas urine which is yellow in color opposite color is red red it should be discarded in red bin okay so blood bag will go into yellow bin okay right <coughs> okay so now any doubts yes you people are right it is yellow bag okay now what is mass there is something called massive transfusion there is a concept called massive transfusion okay there is a concept called massive transfusion listen to this carefully again this is a i'm giving a q mark on this it can be asked in your exams okay what when do you call it as massive blood transfusion whenever you give so 10 units 10 units of whenever you give 10 units of prbc in 24 hours or there is one more definition also or when you give four units of prbc in one hour okay in one hour then this is called as massive blood transfusion whenever you give 10 units of prbc in whole day that is 24 hours or four units of prbc within one hour if you are administering then it is called as massive blood transfusion okay so what are the what are all the complications that client can develop due to this massive blood transfusion see uh, i already told you blood packets are stored in cool te cooler temperatures whenever you give this cool blood okay the patient can develop hypothermia right and see the blood packets contain citrates the anticoagulant which is present in that blood bag will be citrate okay high citrate levels when you are giving to the patient this citrate will go on bind to the serum calcium it will the citrate citrate will go on bind to the uh, serum calcium okay leading to hypocalcemia hypocalcemia and this what is the complication of hypocalcemia laryngospasm right <clears throat> and this high levels of citrate can also cause one more serious uh, acid based disorder which is metabolic alkalosis okay it can also cause metabolic alkalosis and this is this blood is stored for more than what i what what did i say what is the shelf life of prbc 35 days okay when it when the blood is stored for 35 days okay the stored blood will have high levels of carbon dioxide in it okay carbon dioxide when i am discussing abg i already told you carbon dioxide is an acid whenever okay that blood packet will have high levels of carbon dioxide it also can cause acidosis in the client mild acidosis in the patient okay 
and the stored blood also will have high levels of potassium in it it can also cause hyperkalemia right hyperkalemia simultaneously if potassium is going more than 9 yes the patient can go to cardiac arrest right cardiac arrest and uh, obviously whenever when when you, here massive blood transfusion means you are giving high quantity of blood that means whenever you are giving high quantity of blood blood it can also cause circulatory overload it can cause acute heart failure okay circulatory overload these are all the complications that are associated with massive blood transfusion again this massive blood transfusion is very important for your exams okay right okay so now completed with your blood transfusion and blood products everything and now coming to your iv cannula okay so how to see uh, it is not only sizes in iv cannula that you have to remember you also uh, you also have to remember flow rates okay right so how you how to remember iv cannula color codings and size and flow rate is it's very simple i'll just i'll try to explain with this small diagram okay i want all of you to draw this diagram okay with this diagram you can easily remember the color coding sizes and flow rates flow rates also will be asked recently in norset exam i think 4.0 or 5.0 they have asked the flow rate okay green green color cannula ka flow rate kya hai yellow color ka uh, iv color what is the flow rate they can ask you the flow rates also it's very important with just with, you don't need to remember anything with this diagram and mnemonics you can easily remember every, uh, like the flow rate color and sizes okay i want all of you to uh, write this along with me okay so okay what is this color see the diagram which i have drawn here and this is orange right orange this is gray color this is the tree is in green color right uh, this okay the earth is in gray color plant the tree is the plant is in gray color and the flower is in pink color okay the sky is in blue color uh sun is in yellow color birds are in violet color okay these are birds okay so can take it as imagine the uh, those as birds okay right okay now how to remember the sizes okay uh how you will remember the sizes is these are the color codings and sizes is yes it is 14 start with 14 from orange sorry it's not french it is gauze right okay 14 gauze for orange 14 16 18 20 22 24 26 ho gaya right so 14 16 18 20 22 24 26 26 gauze okay right next in between gray and green you have to add one more color which is white color okay white color is 17 gauze okay now start writing the flow rates along with me okay now start writing the flow rates along with me so my favorite number is 10 i'll start with 10 okay so 10 plus 10 for flow rates just you need to know additions okay right 10 plus 10 20 okay now add this to 10 plus 20 is 30 now add this to 20 plus 30 is 50 Okay, now add this to thirty plus fifty is eighty. Fifty plus eighty is one thirty, right? And eighty plus one thirty is two ten. Okay, now stop adding. Now stop adding. And for orange, directly remember it as two seventy ml. Okay, this is the flow rates that you need to remember. Okay, completed the color coding size sizes and flow rates of IV cannula. This is very important. Kindly take a screenshot if you are not writing it. Okay, right. So now, what they are asking here? Any doubts you have in this? Any doubts you have in this? Okay. So now, uh, see here. Uh, IV can. What they are asking here is IV cannula used in BT. IV cannula, which is preferred, the size of IV cannula that is preferred in blood transfusion. Can you people tell me? Let us see who who is going to answer it first. It is eighteen gauze. okay i i have answered it okay next according to atls guidelines trauma guidelines minimum size to be used in case of trauma if a patient is coming in uh, in case of trauma that atls guideline says that at least you have to use minimum of 18 gauze 
uh, IV cannula in that patient. Okay, it is again 18 gauze. Okay, right. So IV cannula is sec secured with. Now you have inserted an IV cannula and you have to secure it. Again, don't secure it with micropore, leucoplast or whatever it may be. Again, IV cannula is all should be always secured with a uh, tegardum. Okay, the transparent one, tegardum. Okay, right. So uh, here they are asking you what is the scale that is used to remove IV cannula. So be before they used to say once in three days, once in five days you have to remove IV cannula but there is no concept like that nowadays. IV cannula, okay, whenever it, now like today you have inserted and by tomorrow if you can see any uh, signs of redness, swelling, that is an indication to remove the IV cannula, okay. So, what, what um, the scale which we use is VIP scale, okay? This um, visual infusion phlebitis scale. Visual infusion phlebitis scale. Score. This scoring system is used to uh, remove the IV cannula, okay? Right. Uh, what is the most common complication associated with the IV cannula? Can you people tell me? You have inserted IV cannula. What is the most common complication that you will encounter in all most of the patients is infiltration. Okay. Right. Infiltration is the most common complication associated with IV cannula. And next. For contrast studies, what is which uh, which uh, size you will be using? The IV cannula which you will be using is for contrast studies, it is 18 gauze. Right. Green cannula need to be used again. Okay. Uh, for BT blood transfusion and contrast studies you will use 18 gauze only okay right and IV cannula that is recommended for cytotoxic therapy for example if you want to give uh, chemotherapy so which size IV cannula is recommended let us see how many members is going to answer for chemotherapy drugs to administer which cannula is preferred what is the size of cannula that is preferred <coughs> yes so, uh, what is this 16 gauze 16 gauze not 16 gauze it is 22 gauze okay for administering cytotoxic agents the one which is preferred is 22 gauze okay and for administering of highly irritant medications which size IV cannula is preferred it is 18 gauze see for blood transfusion for cytotoxic, uh, sorry, for, uh, for blood transfusion, for contrast studies and for administering of irritant medications, it is 18 gauze. Okay, no confusion in it. Okay, and for, um, okay, for uh, cytotoxic therapy, it is 22 gauze and for remaining blood transfusion, contrast studies and irritant medications, it is 18 gauze. Okay, especially if they're asking you pediatric usage, ke liye, uh, if they're asking you for pediatric usage, what is the uh, cannula that is preferred in pediatric group? It is 24 gauze. Okay. Right. <clears throat> it is 24 gauze. Right. Okay. Now coming to one more important topic. Decubitus ulcer. Okay. I think this is the last topic. I'll end it within a um, few minutes. Okay. No need to worry. Okay. So, okay. Right. So, what is the time? Okay. So starting with decubitus ulcer, again this is very important topic for your uh, Norset exam. Uh, okay, let us discuss few important points on decubitus ulcer. Okay, see what is the most common cause of decubitus ulcer? Yes, let us see how many members will answer. What is the most common cause of decubitus ulcer? Friction, okay. Any other things? <coughs> See the low blood circulation, friction, okay. So let me answer it. Okay, it is immobility. Okay. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, immobility. Okay, chronic blood ridden patients. Okay, they are highly prone to develop this decubitus ulcer, which is also called as pressure ulcer. Okay, right. So, the most common site where this pressure ulcer get developed is sacrococcygeal region. Sacrococcygeal region and the one, the scale which is used for risk assessment, pressure ulcer risk assessment, the most common, 
the most common scale that is used is Braden scale. Okay, I want all of you to remember this. Okay, the most common cause is immobility. The most common site is sacrococcygeal region. And the most common scale that is used to assess the risk of developing pressure ulcers in clients is Braden scale. There are other scales also I'll discuss. Okay, I'll, okay, let me tell you here. The other scales which we have is one is Braden scale. Apart from Brad, Braden scale, for the assessment of risk of decubitus ulcer, we have Norton scale, Norton scale, and we also have Water Law scale, Water Law scale. Okay, but these are not not usually uh, used. The one which is most commonly used in clinicals is Braden scale. I want all of you to remember few important points on Braden scale. Okay. Right, Braden scale again. I am telling you this assessment of this is this scale is especially for the assessment of risk of developing decubitus ulcers. Right, so how many com okay? There are a few components, uh, there are six components. Okay, uh, there are six components in Braden scale. Okay, how you will remember these six components is by a simple mnemonic called Superman. Okay, take the first letters in Superman S for shear and friction. S for shear and friction, another S for sensory perception, okay, and in M, one M is for mobility, and one more M is for moisture, A for activity, N for nutrition. These are all the six components. You will the six components of Braden scale. How you will remember Superman? Okay, right. What is the maximum score? It is a scoring system, right? The maximum score is 23, minimum score is 6. Maximum 23, I said, right? If, a, if the score is 23, that, that means there is no risk at all. If it is 6, it is a severe risk of developing pressure ulcer. Okay. Next, stages of pressure ulcer. Okay. Okay. Uh, as per NI NPUAP guidelines, in pressure ulcer we follow a guidelines called NPUAP. Okay, we the guidelines that they follow wali, right? So this is a panel. Okay, this NPUAP is National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. Okay, according to this panel, let us see how many stages are there. Okay, it is four plus two, four stages plus two named stages. Let us see what are those. Okay. Four stages is stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. Okay. Stage 1. If it in stage 1, it involves epidermis. Okay. There is no skin breakdown. Stage 1, my dears, there is skin is intact. Let me write down like this. Skin is intact. That means there is no skin breakdown in stage 1. There will be edema. Okay. E for epidermis, E for edema. Stage 1. Stage 2. And there will be erythema, erythema, edema, you will see in stage 1. Whereas stage 2, epidermis plus dermis. If it involves, then it is stage 2. And from stage 2, you will see skin breakdown. Okay, very important. Stage 1, you will not see skin breakdown. The skin will be bilkul normal, like bilkul intact. It is not normal, it, there will be erythema, non-blanching erith uh, erythema and edema in uh, stage 1. Whereas in stage 2, uh, it involves epidermis and dermis also and the skin breakdown gets started from stage 2. Stage 3, epidermis plus dermis along with these two layers, the subcutaneous layer is also involved, right? And stage 4, epidermis dermis subcutaneous all the layers of your skin plus muscles bones tendons are also involved in stage 4 then it is called as stage 4 okay and these are the four stages the and two named stages i have told you right okay those are one is unstageable one is called as unstageable what is unstageable Okay, whenever you see this black scar formation, scar tissue, 
<clears throat> so if if you see any pressure ulcer and there is black black scar formation on that, so you cannot if you cannot able to differentiate it, yes, it becomes unstageable, right? And one more is which we have is suspected deep tissue injury. Deep tissue injury. What is this suspected deep tissue injury? Okay, here the skin turns into maroon or okay, purple color. Okay, skin becomes purple or maroon, it shows purple or maroon discoloration. Okay, and skin becomes boggy and mushy here. Okay, skin becomes boggy. Okay, that is suspected deep tissue injury. Okay, so these are the four plus two as per your NUP, NPUAP. Okay, National Pressure Ad uh, Ulcer Advisory Panel. Okay, these are the okay. If stages, stages, So NPUAP Okay. So NPUAP says four plus two, four stages plus two named stages to okay. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Stage one epidermis is involved. The skin is bilkul uh, intact here. There is no skin breakdown. Stage two is epidermis and dermis. Skin breakdown starts from stage two. Okay. Stage three, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous is a subcutaneous layer is also involved stage 4 is all the layers of skin is involved okay and muscles bones and tendons are also involved in stage 4 and the remaining two are the one is unstageable when do you say it as unstageable if you see in pressure ulcer when you are doing inspection if you see that black scar tissue the black scar tissue okay then you call it as unstageable and the last one is deep tissue injury <coughs> deep tissue suspected deep tissue injury suspected deep tissue injury here the skin shows maroon or purplish discoloration and skin becomes boggy okay then it is called as suspected deep tissue injury okay i want all of you to remember this uh, stages according to npuap guidelines okay right okay so now how you will take care of pressure ulcers how you will clean the wound my dears, kindly remember one important point I want all of you to uh, remember. Never clean the pressure ulcer with betadine, hydrogen peroxide or whatever it may be. Okay. So only cleaning the pressure ulcers will be done by normal saline. You have to clean the pressure ulcer only using normal saline, not you povidone that is your betadine hydrogen peroxide do not use it okay and dressing there is a special type of dressing usually we get in uh, no, uh, okay you will hear you you would be hearing frequently this name called mepilex right mepilex dressings usually physician says okay there is a pressure ulcer go do mepilex dressing okay see mepilex is nothing but foam foam dressing okay and we also have something called hydrocolloid dressing Okay, these are the special dressings that which we have for decubitus ulcers. Okay, again, I am telling you, whenever you are performing dressing to pressure ulcer wound, do not clean it with betadine, do not clean it with uh, hydrogen peroxide, only clean the wound with normal saline and then you will perform this hydrocolloid or foam dressings. Okay, if needed, you can give packing. If needed, you can perform packing, sterile gauze packing, which is soaked in normal saline. Okay, you will soak the gauze, sterile gauze in normal saline, you will pack it and you will give the foam dressing if needed okay foam dressings can be used as a secondary dressing after packing okay right so cleaning with normal saline dressing with foam dressing that is your mepilex mepilex is a brand name okay it's a brand name foam dressing or hydrocolloid dressing these are the special dressings which we have for uh, decubitus ulcers okay right what are the other two scales that i have told one is northern scale Norton scale and the other one is water low scale okay apart from Braden scale okay but the Braden scale is the one which is commonly used okay right <clears throat> I think I have completed with my uh, today's session okay <clears throat> so thank you all thank you so much for attending the class so see you all uh, very soon okay in uh, uh, in part two okay 
I'll discuss uh, still there are few important topics that I'll cover in next part. I think I'll complete the FON in one or two videos. Okay. Maybe in one or two days, I'll take the, my next session and I'll complete my uh, remaining part of FON. Okay. And do watch my psychiatry rapid division. I want all of you to uh, uh, watch that before uh, giving your NORSET exam. Okay. Many, uh, uh, almost 80%, 80 to 85% of syllabus have been covered in my rap, ultra rapid division psychiatry. It is uh, available in my channel. You can go check there and don't miss this FON ultra rapid division classes also. And please, if you have like, uh, if you have uh, liked my lecture, do like, do give a like to this video, okay? So that it will get recommended to your friends, okay? So I want all of you, those who are attending live today, I want all of you to click on that like button, okay? Right? Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, okay? <coughs> For attending the lecture, uh, stage one pressure ulcer, yes. Yeah, so take lenses. Yeah, defense mechanisms. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, Vijaya, I have uh, the that is what I'm saying, right? 85% of syllabus only I have covered, right? Uh, the one which is left is uh, this um, psychiatric, this uh, de uh, defense mechanisms. So let me cover it in one more class. Okay. My next class will be on FON only, Ultra Re Rapid Revision Part 2, where a few more important golden topics I'm going to cover. Okay, so thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, do share this video to all the persons who are preparing for set, not only North set exam, this content will be same. Everywhere the content is same, who is preparing for state exams or DSSB, other central exams, you can share my videos. Uh, do like, I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, okay, this, I'm asking for a favor from all of you. Do like uh, this video so that it gets recommended to other people who are preparing for North set. Okay. Right. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Uh, see you all in one more in, uh, interesting class very, very soon. Okay. Good night. <clears throat>